Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Coast Connections. As ever, I want to acknowledge that we're coming to you from the traditional territory of the Sunemi First Nations here in Nanaimo, BC. We've got a really interesting guest for you today. He's been beat up, pummeled, fallen off of helicopters, flown off motorcycles, all to prepare him for a brief stint in politics, I think. <laughs> but he got up every time. In fact, he got up and walked right into the uh, Hollywood Stuntman Hall of Fame. He's the first Canadian ever to be put into, inducted into that Hall of Fame. Please welcome Peter Kent. Hi. Hi, Peter. How are you? <laughs> very good, thank you. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. And your claim to fame, Peter, is 14 years in Hollywood and you were none other than Arnold Schwarzenegger's stunt double. Yeah, um, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, And I'm from Nanaimo. There's another claim to fame. There you go. Yeah. And uh, graduated from NDSS High School. Well, I wouldn't say graduated. That's going a bit far. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they tried to get me out of NDSS, but uh, yeah, the graduation thing never happened. Though. Well, they got you out of NDSS and right into Hollywood. Pretty much, yeah. 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 You grew up in North Van yeah. and you were uh, a very much a risk taker as a small child. In fact, I think you were called the uh, Tarzan of North Van. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yeah, I, I was a, a big into tree climbing. Yeah. And, you know, jumping off of cliffs and in the river and all that kind of stuff, you know, just kind of out in the wilds. I would literally leave the house in the morning and my mom had no idea where I was and I'd come back, resurface for food every once in a while. And, yeah. <laughs> and I heard once that you built a ramp on top of your mother's 12 foot hedge yeah. and rode your bikes up there and jumped my, off of there. Yeah, my tricycle. Yeah. <laughs> and I also. Your tricycle. Yeah, and I also passed my dad standing on the trike with one foot on the on the steering handle and one foot on the seat. And as he looked in the rear view, I went face down on the street. Wow, you were an adrenaline junkie from a very young age. Yeah, pretty much. So, yeah. So tell us about how you like um, went from NDSS high school to Hollywood. Tell us about your first day there when you landed in Hollywood and why you ended up there. Well, uh, I, I had been working in Ambi Sound in Victoria in 1982, uh, and then uh, the economy wasn't doing very well, and it commissioned sales, I wasn't making any money, and I just decided I wanted to go somewhere. Yeah. And uh, I had done a lot of theater acting in uh, Belfry Theater here and Yellow Point Theater, mm -hmm. uh, and so I just thought, you know, I'm going to go to L.A. And uh, you know, you look back at it now and you think, what a naive thought, because a lot of people have attempted that and come to no good. Um, but I did anyway. I had 1,500 bucks, and I uh, landed. I remember coming down the street in the bus and I was sitting directly behind the bus driver and he said do you know where you are and I said no and he goes this is Hollywood baby <laughs> and it was on it was uh, Sunset Boulevard Wow. and so I got out and I stayed in the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel which was the you know the stomping grounds of Rudolph Valentino and the likes of them uh, and so um, yeah and I, I, I couldn't afford to stay there very long because it was 50 bucks a night and I didn't have much money so I went over to the Y two days later Okay. And um, I just started, you know, kind of cold calling from what I thought was uh, was Hollywood newspapers, which turned out to be just a sheet of paper that was uh, Xeroxed and, and given away out of the 7-Eleven. Wow. <laughs> For audition calls for the day. Yeah, yeah, for they, the were, day. they were non-union auditions. It wasn't yeah. Variety magazine. This no. Was, no, no, we <laughs> weren't even, I didn't even know what, about any of it, right? Yeah. I just saw this paper. So I would get a pile of quarters every day, stack them up on the, on the payphone, and just start calling these numbers looking for work. And someone uh, said, you know, do you have a photo? Send us a photo. Well, yeah. I didn't have a headshot. I had a Polaroid. So I sent it over and a couple days later I got a phone call uh, at the front desk of the Y and they said you need to go over to see uh, James Cameron at, uh, at the Hollywood ABC Hollywood Television Center which was only two blocks away. Wow, so. James Cameron no less. Yeah, yeah nothing yeah. like starting at the top. Well, it, was, it was the Terminator at that yeah. point, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, amazing. I just want to back up a little bit because there was an incident in 1980 where you had a very bad uh, car accident, yeah. Peter, which basically changed the course of your life. Um, tell us a little bit about that and how that came to um, change your fate. Well, we were at a party um, in uh, off of Bowen Road in a, a small condo uh, complex that's in there. And it's funny because uh, I'm a realtor now, but I went back to that condo complex on my very first call as a realtor. And it was mind blowing. Like talk about deja vu and, wow. and serendipity. You know, my first, uh, the client said, meet me here, it's on Pride. Yeah. And I went in there and I went, oh my God, this is the place where I was that night. Wow. Um, and we were coming home, it was five o'clock in the morning, going down Waddington and the driver had had a few drinks. We were in the, I was in the back seat with two other girls and a, my friend in the front. And and uh, he punched the car, lost control, went into the ditch about 60 miles an hour and uh, yeah, put me through the windshield. Wow. And that 
changed oh, it your face. Oh, shattered my face yeah. completely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I had uh, 73 pieces of broken bone in this side, 53 in this side, jaw broken off, roof of my mouth, Lafort fractured in three places. So. Wow, you were so lucky to have survived that. Well, yeah, and what was really even luckier was that they, we had a, a brand new plastic surgeon. His name was Dr. Stewart. He had mm-hmm. just arrived like the week before from London. London, England. Yeah, yeah. And, and because they didn't even have anybody that could do um, facial maxillary uh, plastics at that time. If, it, if, I, you know, if he hadn't have been there, um, I would have been auditioning for Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, work is work, right? Yeah, work is work. <laughs> So. so as a result of the facial reconstruction, you ended up, you know, resembling Arnold I, Schwarzenegger. I guess people say that. And, you know, I, I can't really do a comparator because, you know, I, I do look markedly different. I mean, I crushed my nose quite a bit, but it did broaden my cheeks mm-hmm. a lot um, and change my jaw because my jaw got longer from it, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. And, and another funny thing was right before I left to go to L.A., the last Halloween I spent in Victoria, I went out as Conan. No. Uh, so I did the whole makeup on the face. I had long hair anyway. I wrapped myself in a stinking deer hide and I made this gigantic <laughs> wooden sword, right? And went out. And then I, you know, I get to Hollywood and, the, and who do I run into? Marnold. That's too strange. Yeah, very, the stars yeah. kept know, crossing that's re- here. That's, that's just, yeah. just so synchronistic. Yeah. So you're on the set of Terminator of all movies. Um, James Cameron is there, and you actually showed up on the set to do what job? Well, initially I was hired to be a lighting stand-in, mm-hmm. which is just stand under the lights for your actor yeah. so that they, they don't have to do it. Um, but then Jim also looked at me on that initial meeting and he said, I guess he had already hired me for stand-in. And then he turned back and he said, have you ever done stunts before? And I thought, you know, if I say no to this, maybe I don't have a job because maybe it's an integral part of this thing. So I just said yes. And he said, okay, great, sign him up for that too. To, and so I was, paying, I was paid $40 a day flat. For the whole Terminator for the, for the, movie? For the whole movie, every day $40 flat. Seriously? Yeah, non-union, yeah. Did you get any royalties or no. commissions? No, because or I wasn't in the union. Right. They, and yeah. they did promise to give me um, what's called a Taft-Hartley letter, mm-hmm. which allows you to get into the union afterwards. And when we got to the end of the movie, they said, oh, sorry, we gave them all away. Oh. <laughs> so I managed to get in anyway. So, And you made a fortune in other ways with memories and all kinds oh, yeah. of uh, yeah. interesting things. So no experience as a stuntman. No. You go on there as naively and boldly as, as you are. Good combination of words, <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Naive especially. Yeah. And... Uh, the, the, the fellow that noticed this, he sort of took you under his arm, right? And sort of well, yeah, gave our, you a few tips. And Yeah, our stunt coordinator. I mean, I, eventually they sorted out that I wasn't, uh, <laughs> you know, everything I was cracked up to be. Um, <laughs> but I tried really hard to cover myself. But uh, yeah, and so Frank Orsati said to me, you know, maybe I, I should give you a hand here and help you out. Um, and basically that's what happened. And then after that movie, uh, a little while later, Arnold called me for Commando. And then um, I got... I kind of put under the wing of a fellow named Bob Yerkes, mm-hmm. who trained uh, actors for Circus of the Stars. I don't know if you ever remember that series a long time ago. A long time ago. Where actors used to do circus tricks and ride on horseback and stand on the horses and all that stuff. And Brooke Shields was in it and a bunch of other people. So uh, Bob was the trainer for that, for all those actors. And he had a huge facility out in San Fernando Valley. Hmm. So invited me out there and, and started training me. So I actually got some bona fide training. Hmm. Now, Peter, you did actually 14... Uh, uh, I think 14 movies with mm-hmm. Arnold, but you were in the industry for over just over 14 years, I believe. Well, it, the, what's the average time that a stuntman actually survives in that industry? <laughs> <laughs> well, survival is one thing, but I mean, the uh, the average most stunt people, most stunt guys and stunt women will probably go seven years mm-hmm. and then they step out and become a coordinator, which allows you to just, you know, you go, all you do is make your calls, you stand around on the set, you help to yeah. coordinate the stunt, help the riggers rig it if that's what's required, make sure that your players are there for the next day, mm-hmm. um, all of that stuff, you know, log the hours, all of that, but that's more like administration to me. Right. And so I never really wanted to do that. And, um, you know, I, I just, so I just kept going and Arnold kept making movies and I kept doing them and, uh, you know, we got to the point where it was 14 and wow. I just... Yeah, and then, you know, things happen. And <laughs> yeah. Now, on the movie The Eraser, mm-hmm. um, that was when you almost met your maker. That was yeah, the most of dangerous. Happening. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 
that. Tell us a little bit about what happened on that movie. Well, We've got a couple of visuals we'll be showing here okay. too. So in the movie, there's a, a, a scene where Arnold is fighting with Jimmy Kahn and Vanessa Williams, he's holding Vanessa Williams hostage and Arnold is trying to rescue the damsel in distress. They're on top of a big, uh, a big uh, sea can container, three ton shipping container that was being carried by a crane a gantry towards the hold of a freighter and they're battling on the top of it as it's being moved. So the idea in the stunt was Arnold smashes the overhead gears and the box falls and everybody falls with it. So that for the stunt people we would have wires on our backs to a jerk vest which is a vest you put on under your clothes mm -hmm. and those wires would be hidden later and computer generated taken out and so the camera looking down from above the illusion would be that you were falling with the box till 20 Correct. feet off the deck, the wire would pull you away and then the box would shatter on the deck but it would look like you'd ridden it to the ground and then they could cut in at that point. So to make that all work, those four cables in each corner of that box have to cut simultaneously and they didn't. Oh. And we all felt that. It was one of those gags, the, the first one ever where we all had a sense of dread, the three stunt players that doubled the actors yeah. and we were looking at each other going something's going to go sideways. Yeah. And you know, but you can't call a hundred million, uh, sorry, a hundred thousand dollar stunt on a gut feeling because you know you they you don't you don't get to work in town anymore. But of course, you don't get to work in town if you're dead either. No. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. So, what injuries did you sustain in? in well, that? I broke my collarbone, yeah. my scapula, my top three ribs, uh, cracked my ankle. Throughout your years, are there any bones you didn't break? Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't break my legs yeah. and my arms. I've broken no long bones. Wow. So. You, you get to you know how to roll with the punches. Peter. I guess so. Yeah, I tore my knees pretty badly mm -hmm. doing a motorcycle stunt, but yeah. Do you still ride motorcycles? No. No. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I was offered in in Terminator Two. We had five of the Harleys, mm -hmm. and I was offered one of them by Jim, and then. Uh, I had a friend and his girlfriend that were killed out in Redlands in California like a couple of days before that happened and I just wasn't in the mood and in retrospect I look back and wish I would have kept the bike because it was such an iconic piece but yes. at that point when he offered it to me I just said no. Yeah, it was a bit of a turn yeah. off then. Uh, Terminator 2 where you're riding uh, down through the canal and the uh, truck blows up in, in the yeah. background yeah. and you're riding with a young um, uh, fella, the, the, boy, the character who played the boy. Yeah. Is that really him or no. is that okay? No, it's a guy named uh, Bobby. Yeah. Um, uh, I can't remember Bobby's. Oh, Bobby Porter. Uh, he's a very small man. Okay. Um, and so he was the right size for the kid. And if you look at when you show the graphic for this, if you look carefully at the face, yeah. you'll see that it's not Eddie. Eddie Furlong, who was the kid, yeah. Okay. Was that the movie where you actually had the molded face mm. of Arnold? Tell yeah. us about that process. So, I was the first guy ever in the industry, the first stunt guy ever, to wear this mask, which was a sum and the difference of Arnold's and my faces. And so they would make this mold out of latex rubber and then apply it in pieces. And if you, if you have the photo, you'll see the chunks of how I, they put it on me. And then it's all made up around that. So the initial idea was, you know, uh, the makeup artist and Jim thought that this was a great idea. And I got called in and they said, OK, we're going to put this on you. And so it was a six hour process the first time. Um, so I was sitting in the chair and of course I'm hating this as we go along, right? Because I'm thinking we're going to do this every day. Oh. And so it was at the house where uh, Jeanette uh, Gold, Goldsmith puts her hand through the guy's milk carton through his face and when she's the other Terminator. So Jim was inside shooting that and he said, when it's all done, drive by on the Harley and look over at me and I'll come out and check it out. So I roared past and he gave me the thumbs up and I was like, my heart just dropped. I was like, damn it, now I'm going to have to wear this for, and I wore it 66 consecutive days and then probably another 30 scattered out past that so and it was about four or five hours in makeup every day getting that on you yep. yeah yeah it, we whittled it down to about four hours and then you know they would they would take it off which was another process because you'd have to peel it off and then use a glue remover on your face because it was surgical glue and then hot towels and then scrub it off and your skin would break out and they wouldn't care the next day they just paint glue over all that <laughs> Um, $40. Yeah, <laughs> well, no, they, at that point, by the time we got to T2, I was making some decent money. I was union and getting paid, you know, by each, what they call it a, an adjustment for each stunt that you do. So, yeah. Now, Peter, spending that much time on set, uh, over 14 movies with Arnold Schwarzenegger, you must have become quite uh, good friends. T talk to us a bit about what that relationship was like with Arnold and his family. Um, well, it's funny because when I first met him, I came on, the, we were shooting in the uh, parking structure of the Department of Water and Power on the first night of Terminator night shoot. Mm -hmm. So I arrived and he, I hadn't met him before. So I was a bit, you know, trepidatious sure. and I come down, they've dressed me in the wardrobe and everything. And I see in the back, there's the lights on and it's kind of smoky. And I see him sitting, smoking a cigar in, the, in his chair in the corner. And I walk up and he looks up at me and he goes, ah, 
you the double? And I'm like, kind of nod. And he goes, ah, you're too tall. <laughs> and I thought, I figured that was it. I was finished, right? Okay. And, and then I turned around to, on my heels to walk away. And he goes, I'll get over here and sit down. Uh-huh. So, you know, and then, you know, we, we got along. I, st- I Of course, I would try and, you know, make coffee for him and stuff. And he would look, you know, ah, too much sugar, throw it out the window. And, um, <laughs> but I, it ended up that I would cook for him on a regular basis. And then we got to a point where I, I was working out with him every day mm-hmm. uh, in Venice in California. And then um, I, we would, at some point, he, he discovered that I had, uh, my acting coach was Zena Provendy. Because I started out as an actor before I was ever a stuntman. And Zena Provendy was the head coach at MGM for 20 years. And so uh, once he realized that I, you know, I, I knew what I was talking about as an actor, he would have me read scenes with him. So we'd go over to his house and sit around the pool and have a cigar and read the scripts back and forth and work on the lines. <clears throat> and then at another point, I taught myself German, hmm. which, you know, he, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> and, but he was dumbfounded. He's like, how did this happen? And I was like, well, you know, because he used to, he used to ridicule me in German and I figured I needed to figure out what he was saying for one. <laughs> Uh, and then he would always try to set me up with his mother who would come from Austria and he'd say, you know, Sprech bin Mutti, speak with my mom. Yeah. And of course, all I knew was four letter words. So, <laughs> because that's what you learn in a foreign language right away, right? Up for yeah, so Mutti, was, Mutti would be like, mm. yeah. <laughs> um, And speaking of Mutti, we have a lovely shot of you with your Mutti, your dear oh, yeah. sweet mom and Arnold on the set of, uh, I think it was uh, Jingle All the Way? No, that was, that was uh, Kindergarten Cop. Kindergarten Cop. Yeah. It and was, it was on her birthday, I think, that you yeah. had her on set. Yeah, no, it was my birthday. Your birthday. Yeah, no, she came down for my birthday, and we were shooting uh, the fair scene uh, where Arnold kind of gravitates towards the teacher, right. uh, Penelope Ann Mil- Miller's character. And, uh, yeah, so my mom came, and she worked as a background player for uh, a couple of days on that while everybody got sunburned, and she hung up. Arnold was always Aww. very gracious to her, and, you know, if she was tired, he'd let her come in and sleep in, the, in his trailer in the back, nice. in the bedroom and stuff like that. So, yeah, he was always good to her. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, your mom lived to see the successes that you had in these movies. Oh yeah, as well. my mom and my dad both. Uh, my dad passed away in '89 when I was in Mexico on uh, on True Lies. Uh, sorry, on Total Recall. Um, and, but my mom didn't pass away till 2005, so she was basically there for the entire run of it. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Um, Peter, is there a stunt that you uh, wish you would have done? Is there one that you left behind, or is there one that you sh- wish you never would have tried? <laughs> that's a loaded question um i don't know i don't i think i've run the gamut i mean i've done fire burns you know car hits high falls i, I did 20 stories uh on a wire and then another 10 into a bag um which is uh, quite harrowing uh to look down from 20 stories up with no airbag underneath you just on a wire falling and you fall at at free fall and then it's called a decelerator system. And then the fan decelerator kicks in and it literally slows you down the last three stories and puts you on the ground. Because the fan is blowing up at you? No, it's a, it's, a, it's a fan descender. What it is is it's wire wrapped around a gigantic spool. So you have to have enough to go up 20 stories, go through a shiv, which is a pulley, and down 20 stories. So there's that much wire played out. Wow. So if that wire breaks and you're looking over the concrete, that's it, that's right? It. You just go straight to the cement. Peter Kent, do you believe in an afterlife? Yeah. <laughs> What scares you? Anything? Uh, my children now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have twin sons. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, and they are. How old are they now? They're twelve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And are they going to follow in your footsteps? And would you want them to? Oh hell no. <laughs> no. Uh, well, I believe that, you know it's funny because the first thing I taught them when they were about two was how to tuck their chins in when they fell because you don't want to hit the back of your head, right? So sure. as you're doing a backfall, you tuck your chin to your chest. And so the first time I took them, uh, I think in the shopping carts, we were in the, in the save on drugs or something like that. And I rider wanted to, the, the bigger of the two, he wanted to stand up in the shopping cart. I kept saying, no, I turned my back for one sec. He stood up and fell straight out of the shopping cart and landed on his back on the floor of the, the linoleum floor in the store. Not and I, head. and I was like, <gasps> yeah. and he popped up and he goes, I'm okay, dad. I tucked my chin. Oh. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God. Okay. Best stunt ever. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, oh, because I thought he knocked, he knocked himself out, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Now, with the, all the experience that you had in Hollywood, Peter, you then brought all that together and started the School of Hard Knocks, of course, mm. in uh, North Vancouver. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, yeah, I, I had decided, first thing, 
I'll, I'll preface this because I had a, a TV series called Stunt Dogs, which was on Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted to do with that series was to recreate, you know, renowned or, or well-recognized stunts like my bike jump and other things, uh, Fast and Furious stunts and that kind of thing. Um, and, but we wanted to do it with, na uh, with uh, naive young stunt players who had never really done a big gag before sure. so we could get the look of terror in their eyes, <laughs> right? Because that was a key piece to the whole show. Um, and what I found was a lot of pushback from the union of stunt performers in Vancouver that, didn't, that wanted their seasoned professionals mm -hmm. and seasoned folks to be involved in that and didn't want to see these young guys get a chance to come up. Right. And if, I found it really annoying mm -hmm. because without, that, without those people supporting me, I never would have had that either. And so, you know what, I thought, well, I want to train some of these people. I want to help them to get enough skill that they can go out there and do that because there was no, and I still don't think at this time there is a school of any kind that teaches stunts. Mm -hmm. And so we taught stair falls, high falls, uh, car hits, wire flying, uh, weapons training, hand-to-hand uh, -hand fighting. We taught pretty much everything you could do. And at the end, you got to do a full burn, which, you know, wow. was pretty crazy because we, we did over 300 full burns in the course of the school mm -hmm. and not one injury. Congratulations. Yeah, That's, you know, yeah. safety first, It right? was harrowing, though, yeah. to light, every time you go to light something. And I even had one student who changed his mind. You know, and I, he, I said, you paid for it. And he, I, had the, I had the torch lit, so I had to chase him around and set him on fire and then chase him with the fire extinguisher to put him out just so we'd have the footage for his reel. <laughs> I'm like, you're getting it. <laughs> I don't think I'll hear that twice <laughs> on this set. No. Um, so what's next? I hear there's a documentary film being made about your well, whole life. We're working on that, yeah, with uh, A&E. I have a partner, uh, uh, Murray, who's uh, got Murmur Pictures out of Vancouver, and we pitched it to Imagine Films, which is Ronnie Howard's company, uh, Paramount Studios, to uh, Disney slash Hulu, streaming services, and to A&E. Um, and so they're all looking at the proof of concept for it right now. And so we'll see how it goes, but there's, it's been well received so far. Very good. Yeah. That, and that'll come out in... Well, we, I don't know. I, wouldn't, I would imagine that even if we got a green light for it now, mm -hmm. it probably wouldn't be for it until 2023 or 24 maybe, but mm -hmm. we'll see if I live that long. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I think you have 29 lives, yeah. <laughs> more well. than most people. <laughs> yeah. I think I've exhausted most of them and all of my guardian <laughs> angels as well. Yeah. Well, I think your mother's one. You yeah, showed well, us the, uh, the epic bracelet oh yeah, this that you're is, uh, This was uh, 28 bra bangles that my mom had on her whole life, and when she passed away, I had it, them all cut off and melted and then uh, made into this that my good friend Bill Helene carved for me. And you showed that to me before the show and that the weight of that bracelet is very, very, very heavy. Yeah, well, I, I, I didn't know what to do with all those bangles and I didn't want to see them go away, so. Well, your mother would be very proud mm -hmm. and I think she's uh, your guardian angel. I think that's why you have 29 lives, yeah. Peter. Well, yeah. she watches over my boys. That's all I really need. They, yeah. they need it too. Nice, very nice. Now, memorable locations that you shot um, when you were doing all the movies? You must have been all over the world. What were some of the um, best spots? Yeah, we, we were pretty much everywhere. And it was great because at that point, Arnold had his own private jet. So that made flying a lot easier. I mean, I did take some commercial flights, yeah. but a lot of time I just flew with him. So, you know, it was very relaxing and you got to breeze in and out of the airport there, you know, just walk on and walk off kind of yeah. thing like you're on a bus. Um, you know, Mexico, a lot, a lot in Mexico. We shot Total Recall in, in Cherubusco Studios in Mexico City. We shot Predator in the jungle down there, uh, which was a long haul and pretty rugged shoot. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, uh, were you also in Twins? I was, yeah. You were, yeah. yeah. I think we've got a shot of you and uh, Arnold in your checkered shirts there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and Danny DeVito, uh, oh, who was a wonderful. You weren't Danny DeVito's stunt double. <laughs> no, no, that was a fellow named uh, Richard Drown, mm -hmm. who uh, was a good friend of mine. I like, like to play some pranks on Danny was a fantastic guy to work with. Great, great sense of humor. Mm, nice. Favorite director? Oh, boy, that's a tough one. I, I would say, I think Jim Cameron mm -hmm. off the top. Only, also a Canadian. Uh, yeah, and I've worked with him three times, Terminator 1, Terminator 2, and then True Lies. Yeah. Um, he can be an obstreperous guy and uh, demanding, um, but I never took any crap from him. And I think that's why we got along so well yeah. was because we're both Canadian. We had that sense of humor that Canadians tend to have. <laughs> and every, a lot of other people lived in terror of him, you know. Mm. Um, and I would just say stuff to him that the crew would just look at me and go, oh, my God, he just said that to Jim? <laughs> you know, and, and Jim would just go, oh, yeah, Peter, be quiet now. And I'd just look at him and laugh. And he hated, he would hate if someone was on set reading a newspaper because he felt like you were stealing time from him somehow, even though it was downtime and you weren't right. working. And so one day I was actually sitting there in my Terminator makeup for T2, reading a newspaper on set and he came up and grabbed it down the middle and tore the piece of the middle out 
So I just looked at him and I stuck the other two pieces back together again and smiled at him over the top and kept looking at it. And he just, <laughs> you know, he flipped me the bird and kept walking, but yeah. <laughs> you bonded. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now you were inducted into the uh, Hollywood Stuntman's Hall of Fame in 2009. Yes. The first and I believe only Canadian to have that accomplishment. The only, yeah, the have, only Canadian citizen. Yeah. yeah. What was that induction ceremony like? Nothing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> they just sent you a certificate. They did. The that mail. basically that's it. Yeah. They, they, there's no fanfare for stunt guys. You don't get the the handprints in the concrete or anything. Oh, oh that's a shame. Yeah. You, you should at least have. Well, a, as you know, they don't the recognize. Cheap print in the concrete. Yeah. Or something. They don't recognize stunt guys in the Academy Awards either, or stunt women. Well, I which think is, that needs to change. It, it, we've yeah. been trying for so long, mm -hmm. and yeah, and you know, there's always pushback for a variety of reasons, which I won't get political on here. But <laughs> any uh, life lessons from a stunt double that you'd like to share with us? Well, uh, and these are lessons I'm imparting to my sons right now mm -hmm. who are somewhat crazy. Um, <laughs> if you're going to try something crazy or a, a crazy stunt, uh, run it a few times slowly, walk it, look at it, test it out, try it a, at a variety of different speeds before you go flat out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that can apply to a lot of areas of life, including yeah, dating so. when they start that. Yeah, yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just take it, take it slow and mm -hmm. adjust it and look at it from several different angles. Uh, you know, because as far as stunts go, there are many of them that are quite unforgiving, mm -hmm. as you know, and some of them can get you killed. Yeah. Many of them can get you killed, which yeah. is why you're out there. So you have to be, I, would, I think I was one of the only stunt guys ever that would show up hours before any, any stunt that I had to do, just so I could see every piece of how it was put together mm -hmm. and run it. And I would say, test that for me so I can see it. Uh, if I could get away with it, I would say, blow that up so I can know, if I'm supposed to stand right here, can you blow that up for me so I can see what it's gonna be like, you know? Peter, that's why you lasted 14 years yeah. and not well, seven. Like but it was a luxury there. because many stunt players don't get that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were times when I was on set and I would say, uh, I, I would go, this isn't safe. And they, they'd try to push you to do it. And I have, uh, there's a litany of horror stories about stunt people getting killed and, and maimed and severely injured because they've been pushed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would just pick the radio up and I'd say, Arnold, this isn't, uh, this isn't safe right now. And he would say, give the radio to the AD. Mm -hmm. I'd hand the radio back and Arnold would go, yeah, give Peter what he needs here. Very good. <laughs> but a lot of people don't have that luxury. No, they don't. And we don't have a luxury of time right now, Peter. We're running out of time here. So uh, with respect, I'd like you to take us out of this episode of Coast Connections. Okay. Well, <laughs> everybody tune into our YouTube channel here. We'll see you next time. Subscribe. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on Coast Connections with Peter Kent, Canada's one and only stuntman in the Hollywood Stuntman Hall of Fame. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>